Hi there, everyone. I'm Betsy Peterson, the director of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. And on behalf of the staff, I'd like to welcome you to the latest presentation in our Benjamin Botkin Lecture Series. Uh, a word about the Botkin Series. The Botkin Series allows us to highlight the, the work of leading scholars and researchers in the disciplines of folklore, ethnomusicology, oral history, and cultural heritage. It's also an opportunity to enhance our archival collections. Um, each lecture is videotaped and it will become part of the permanent archive um, and the permanent collections of the center. And in addition, the lectures will also later be posted on the website um, as a webcast so that people around the world will be able to listen and people of you know, future generations will also be able to, to hear um, our wonderful discussion today. So with that said, please turn off any cell phones or electronic devices if you have them. I would greatly appreciate it. Um, the fields of folklore and ethnomusicology, as I think we know, have long-standing interests in older traditions and practices. But I think it would be a mistake for us to think that folklorists and ethnomusicologists are only interested in that. We are equally interested in documenting how traditions emerge, adapt, and evolve in com contemporary culture. And today's speakers are very much on the cutting edge of documenting today's world. As authors and editors of the 2018 Indiana University Press's scholarly volume, Black Lives Matter in Music, Protest, Intervention, and Reflection, they have compiled a collection of compelling critical studies drawn from their ethnographic research and personal encounters to illustrate how scholarly research and teaching about the role of music in the Black Lives Matter movement can contribute to public awareness of social, economic, political, scientific, and other injustice in American society. It also is an, it provides um, glimpses and examinations of gentrification, cultural displacement, and, despair, and education disparities often, that often function as enduring and systemic forms of violence. As ethnomusicologists, they will focus on how musicians continue to provide a soundtrack for the Black Lives Matter movement. So I'm delighted today to welcome our speakers, Dr. Fernando Orejuela, who is the senior lecturer in, department, in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology and an adjunct professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies and Latino Studies at Indiana University. Folklorist and ethnomusicologist, Dr. Stephanie Shonikin, professor and chair of the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Allison Martin, a PhD candidate in folklore and ethno ethnomusicology at Indiana University. So how we will proceed this for this hour, um, each speaker will give a short presentation on their research related to Black Lives Matter in music before engaging in a broader discussion on music and protest in contemporary society. And to participate and, and um, guide that conversation, um, I also want to welcome our Washington-based colleague, um, esteemed colleague, Dwandalyn Reese, who will serve as discussant for the second half of today's program. Uh, Dwandalyn is an ethnomusicologist and, and museum professional, and she is the curator of music and performing arts at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. She's also co-chair and curator of the Smithsonian Year of Music, which is going on all year. Um, and we are pleased to be co-sponsoring this event in cooperation with the Smithsonian Year of Music. And I would also like to acknowledge and thank the library's Daniel A.P. Murray Association for its support. Following the program, the library bookshop will be selling copies of Black Lives Matter and music, and they're, they are out there in the foyer. And um, we'll be happy to sell you a copy, and I think the authors might eat also be happy to sign and certainly be available for additional discussion. 
So with all of that said now, um, thank you for coming and please join me in welcoming our guests. Welcome everybody. Uh, I want to first begin by thanking the Library of Congress community for uh, inviting us and for all of you for actually showing up during your lunch hour. To begin my portion, I'd like to provide some contextual information. Black Lives Matter was the brainchild of Alicia Garza, Patricia Kahn Coolers, and Opal Tometi. The phrase was first conceived during the days following the controversial acquittal of George Zimmerman for the murder of Trayvon Martin just a few weeks after his 17th birthday. Garza in particular is credited with inspiring the slogan. Moments after the acquittal, she posted on Facebook, black people, I love you. I love us. Our lives matter. Black lives matter. Which Con Coolers then shared with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. The core ideals of the Black Lives Matter movement is outlined by Alicia Garza. In providing a history of the movement, Garza argues that Black Lives Matter is, quote, an affirmation of black folks' contribution to the society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression, end quote. While there are other explanations of the movement, I take this definition from one of the founders as my starting point in understanding Black Lives Matter. Immediately, the hashtag struck a nerve. Many embraced it. As Opal Tometi explains, quote, we gave tongue to something that we all knew was happening. We were courageous enough to call it what it was, but more than that, to offer an alternative, an inspirational message, Black Lives Matter, end quote. Others were offended. All lives matter, they retorted. No argument. And that's not, not the message. One of our Latino graduate students at IU suggested that hashtag Black Lives Matter too would have been more palatable. But it's not a time to feel passively about the unjust death of a teenage black child by an adult non-black man accosting him unprovoked. When Garza says black lives matter, we're talking about the ways in which black people are deprived of basic human rights and dignity. It is an acknowledgement of black poverty, institutionalized discrimination, and genocide as state violence. It is an acknowledgement that one million black people are locked in prisons in this country it is an act of state violence. And the fact is that the lives of black people, not all people, exist within these conditions is consequence of state violence. How to talk about Black Lives Matter without talking about place? One way to start is location, to specify its coordinates. In this case, this means exactly what to any of us. Black Lives Matter slowly took shape over the course of the following year, and the three women teamed up to set up social media accounts under the name and starting planning. When Michael Brown was shot, the movement gained momentum. Ferguson has become shorthand for the death of Michael Brown, for a grand jury's non-indictment of the police officer who shot him, and for the Department of Justice recommendation not to bring civil rights charges against the officer. Why here? One stark difference. Trayvon Martin was killed by a self-appointed guardian of a gated community. And the gates are symbolic. It separates neighborly interaction and the idea of community. Whereas Mike Brown was part of an ungated community, he was known in the neighborhood. And thus, the movement responded to this action by an authoritative presence and a familiar oppression that turned deadly. One call to action stimulated others to respond. For example, students at the University of Missouri broadcast their frustration with bigotry, anti-homosexual and anti-transgender attitudes practiced on their campus with no repercussions. Protests followed, as well as a hunger strike all of which were observed in Stephanie's chapter in our book. Move to these coordinates. Indiana University students vocalized similar experiences as the protesters at Ferguson and the Mizzou students. On an anonymous safe space application called Yik Yak, striking comments were posted criticizing the students who, at IU who were protesting, for example, one anonymous student posted, quote, there's no racism at IU. Go back to Africa, you Blafricanist, end quote. In that same week, the lives of our students of color were threatened by an anonymous online assailant who wrote, if you're not white, don't come to class today. In response to these events, the Black Graduate Student Organization held an emergency meeting at the end of the week. I attended with my colleague, Valerie Grimm. They invited the provost, the dean of students, and requested the police to be present given the threat to their lives. 
The police declined the request because there was a basketball game at the same time as the meeting. The chapters in our book ask readers to immerse themselves in narratives of local scenes to talk about local experiences as a way of engaging with place that focus on uniqueness and particularity, separating one place from all others. But the local never exists alone, but intersects with our other interactive realities because these locales speak to experiences and modes of communication that also situate them with translocal and virtual communities. Thus, the experiences in Ferguson, Cleveland, Baltimore, New York City, Baton Rouge, etc., are protest spaces and not just coordinates where residents and supporters shift otherwise oppressive geographies of a city to provide a site to honor a victim and to politicize. Songs, especially after Michael Brown sued, emerged full force and rap and R&B became the soundtrack of the burgeoning movement. J. Cole's Be Free or Solange's Mad bear musical witness to the frustration, anger, sadness that helped activists unpack their feelings in artful expressions. And we're still getting music done today. 2018, 2019, you got Joey Badass's Lands of the Free, Childish Gambino's This Is America, and Jamila Wood's 2019 album, Legacy Legacy. I mean, the entire album, even if you're not a fan of R&B, this is an album that you gotta listen to. And then this happens. Kendrick Lamar's All Right becomes the anthem of the movement. In particular, the hook resonates with the protesters. The anthemic recitation provides embodied and sonorous reclamation that black lives, black, black bodies, exist here. The success of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, challenging white supremacy, made African-American politics and culture an important source of inspiration and information for the artists. As the civil rights movement evolved into a black power movement dedicated to securing resources and self-determination for black community rather than merely an end to legal segregation, nationalism emerged as a powerful tool for political and cultural mobilization. The rise of the black power movement offered all Americans of color an alternative to simply seeking assimilation in the mainstream, shifting from we shall overcome to black power language for upward mobility and advancement without deracination. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud that is seeking the rewards of inclusion into American society, but not assimilation. Now, just a quick warning. Uh, the next slide is gonna have some strong language and you're gonna hear some of the strong language, so I just wanna let you be aware of that. And there's gonna be the use of the N-word in this piece. Hey, Soundway, turn this shit up, nigga. Turn this shit up. Soundway, turn this shit up, nigga. Tell me who the bitch nigga hating on me. Jumping on my dick, but this dick ain't free. To rip a butterfly, another classic CD. Get a lullaby for everyone they can see. Blah, 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 blah. Nigga, now RIP. My diligence is only meant to write your eulogy. <laughs> I'll stop that there. Now, this piece is one of the most important pieces in the current state of the movement because, like I said, there was an attachment to this song. Part of it has to do with a lot of... Uh, it's relation to African-American music making, African-American storytelling. In the beginning, there's a toasting element that is part of not just storytelling, but part of hip hop culture that is readily, readily available when you see uh, the MC always acknowledging the music producer, the, the DJ in, in the earliest days. Uh, the Jamaican patois, reconnecting it to the diasporic relationship with the earliest days of hip hop. Um, the recognition of his particular album, To Pimp a Butterfly, that, that the title itself is a really, one, really one important one to kind of break down, but given the time that I'm, I'm allotted, I will have to skip over that. You can ask a little later if you want. But he is absolutely right. The song was intentionally made to bring not just um, uh, his generation to, to pay attention to Black Lives Matter issues, but also previous generations who have kind of been growing up with hip hop since the 1970s, but have been separating themselves because and musically, it has kind of outgrown 
one generation at a time by five years. But this album, he brings in a lot of soul. He brings in a lot of jazz. In fact, jazz musicians played live on this album. He brings in a lot of R&B and funk, musics that were popular in sampling in the 1990s, as well as social conscious lyrics attached to um, those underground scenes. So bringing in several generations to kind of connect with this song, and that's one of the powerful uses of this particular piece and its connection to the, uh, the protesting bodies of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, the We Gonna Be All Right, the emphasis here with the N-word, important, because if we're talking about black power and black issues and black lives mattering, not everyone gets to use this. There are a lot of people who participate, allies in these movements and, and protests, but this is a reminder that this is not a, a song or not a piece that everyone gets to say, but the all right part, we gonna all be all right, is the significant part of the hook that brings generations together and the protesters together. Now, by definition, an anthem is a rousing or inspiring song identified with a particular group. George Lipsitz, who's one of my academic idols, explores, or explains it this way, quote, anthems proudly and defiantly assert group solidarity and reject respectability. These songs do not plot social revolution, but they do keep alive hopes for a better life, end quote. What is beautifully practicable about this anthem is its hook, and the hook is important because it is portable and attaches sonic intimacy with an oral transmission of care, the words themselves. The oral effects of the sound, the rhythmic cadence. The collective effect of the sound that hooks people together and its relation to the movement in a time and, and in a place that they are occupying. With the knowledge also that it is being exercised in different locations similarly, binding the translocal communities together in spirit. Now Black Lives Matter actions are not anti-police. They are anti-oppression building up the community from within and has manifested itself in the following ways. Black Lives Matter today can demonstrate a two-pronged struggle, struggle for electoral change and more power outside the conventional institutions for black folks, a new hopeful promise to build power of the most vulnerable populations through education, campaigns, and direct action. So what might that look like since the earliest days of the movement? Now, the formation of Black Lives Matter is a direct outcome of our poorly designed criminal justice and economic policies. Black Lives Matter does not mean that police lives don't matter. It may be surprising to hear that many police officers have already taken steps to consider reform, embracing reform rather than rejecting it. The apology of Terrence M. Cunningham, who leads the International Association of Chiefs of Police, came during a speech in San Diego at the group's 2016 annual conference. The remarks were an unusual yet symbolic step by law enforcement, whose members have often denied responsibility for deteriorating relationships with the communities they serve. For law enforcement officials to regain the trust of minority, he tells us, they must begin to acknowledge and apologize for the actions of the past and the role that our profession has played in society's historical mistreatment of communities of color. Before his death, rapper Nipsey Hussle was collaborating with police to create programs for youth living in the hostile environments he grew up in and mitigate the strained relationships between his neighborhood and police. Under Chief David Brown, the Dallas Police Department had made substantial changes in progress, although tensions still persist. Police reforms due to Brown's efforts led to increased transparency, training officers to reduce the lethality of interactions between police and its community members, and that is something that has not always been practiced in the past. In fact, Dallas was notorious for police violence. Also, David Brown's encouragement for the community members to see reform then join the force and be that change too. Going forward, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter leaders work with consulting firms to help elect strong leaders and those committed to advancing humanitarian agendas. For example, Chicago made history as Chicago uh, voted to elect their first African-American female mayor. Mayoral candidates Tony Periwinkle on the left and Lori Lightfoot, and Lori Lightfoot wins. This brief talk attempts to conceptualize the Black Lives Matter movement and how young people exercise agency and construct a credible political identity grounded in shared ideology perpetuated since the era of civil rights activism and black empowerment. These young people, artists and street activists alike, do this through speech acts and sonic practices that convey their ideas about injustices and systemic racism in the United States 
and have affected the way police think about policing, as well as supporting government or governance at the city, state, and national level. I'll close with Garza's final, Garza's final thoughts from her history. Quote, Black Lives Matter does not mean your life isn't important. It means that black lives, which are seen as without value with white, within white supremacy, are important to your liberation. When black people get free, everybody gets free. We're not saying black lives are more important than others or that others' lives are not criminalized and oppressed in various ways. We remain in active solidarity with all oppressed people who are fighting for their liberation, and we know that our destinies are intertwined. Now, Garza's observation needs no massaging 200 plus years after emancipation, and we're still not fully addressing the aftermath of American slavery. Black Lives Matter attempts to amplify the voices affected most ardently by our racist past and present. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's nice to be home, even if it's only for a day. <laughs> Since 1995, Washington, D.C. business owner Don Campbell has engaged in a simple yet subversive ritual almost every morning. When he opens his cell phone store, Central Communications, he sets speakers outside of the front door and plays go-go music, D.C.'s local subgenre of funk. The music continues for the duration of the workday, entertaining passersby and causing spontaneous dance parties throughout the day. And while much of the neighborhood enjoys the music, Campbell has received complaints from some community members over the years, and these complaints have only increased as the neighborhood has gentrified. Despite the neighborhood's transformation, Campbell always refused to turn off the music, confident in his compliance with DC noise regulations and knowing well enough to turn down the volume temporarily if the city sent a representative with a decibel meter. This past April, though, things changed when a complaint was sent directly to T-Mobile's corporate office, which owned Campbell's Metro PCS store. The complaining parties, rumored to be from a luxury apartment building across the street, the Shea, uh, threatened to sue T-Mobile if the music was not turned off. As this was relayed to Campbell, he finally turned the music off, understandably unwilling to lose his livelihood. It didn't take long for the neighborhood to notice that the music was off, and less than two weeks later, a Howard University student under the Twiddle handle, Heroin J, tweeted in support of Central Communications using the hashtag Don't Mute DC. So she tweeted, I'm not a fan of GoGo, but the dudes down at Metro PCS on Georgia have stopped playing their music. Apparently the new white neighbors were complaining about the noise. Simply saying gentrification is sickening is an understatement. And then she replied to that, with use the hashtag don't mute DC when you tweet about this, we have to start somewhere. A couple of days later, activist Ron Moulton started a petition entitled Don't Mute DC's Goga Music and Culture. Thousands of tweets and over 80,000 signatures later, the music is back on at Central Communications. The intersection though has changed with Don't Mute DC morphing from hashtag to movement seemingly overnight. Activists, artists, politicians, and countless others in DC have zeroed in on 7th and Florida and the broader Shaw neighborhood as a battleground against gentrification and cultural erasure. In our book, Black Lives Matter and Music, I argued that go-go music exemplified the ideals of BLM, outlined by co-founder Alicia Garza as affirmation of black life and resilience against state oppression. As I have followed the news of central communications, I have been struck by the GoGo community's continued amplification and extension of these goals. The protests and rallies held in defense of GoGo music affirm black life and black sound, rejecting the silencing strategies of gentrification and instead working towards reestablishing a presence in the city proper. Furthermore, the organizers involved here, people like Ron Moton, Kamon Freeman, and especially Yada Yah, are collaborating with a number of organizations that attend to education and public health concerns, making GoGo the soundtrack to a much larger movement. What I want to do today briefly is to expand on the work that I did in Black Lives Matter and Music by thinking through Don't Mute DC and offering a few further provocations on what this movement means for black sound and gentrifying spaces. The first thing I want to offer is that party music, particularly go-go music, is activist music, and that it provides a space for people to fellowship, to heal themselves, and to strategize against cultural erasure. 
For example, in addition to the events held directly in front of Central Communications, there have also been several go-go's held seven blocks down the street in front of the Reef Center at the corner of 14th and U. These events are cleverly named Mochella, a combination of Coachella, the outdoor music festival, and Mo, the DC slang term used to describe another person or friend, as in what's good, Mo. On May 9th, <laughs> that's what they say. Two go go bands performed at Mochella on May 9th ABM and Backyard Band. And I'm going to show you a clip of Backyard's performance now. <laughs> So that's Backyard performing at 14th and U. That's Wainsey singing Pretty Girls and the streets are blocked off uh, in every direction. And this is Big G, the lead talker of Backyard Band. He's wrapped in a DC flag like a cape. And this image got a lot of buzz on the, on the internet because he looks like a superhero. Um, <laughs> This work of bringing together people that are systematically legislated and policed out of a city is activist work. Ethnomusicologist Fredera Hadley has written about this in the context of summers in New York City, where she argues that, quote, much of what people label as nuisance is how people audibly mark public space as theirs. And to many of us, these are the sounds of life and community, end quote. In this moment of rapid gentrification, I maintain that to hold space and to be loud is indeed an affirmation of black life. While the ideals of BLM are not new and are foundational to black struggles across space and time, I find them particularly important in this moment where black people are still killed and harassed and humiliated with little consequence. Amidst the criminalization of black sound, events like Mochella turn gogos into activist spaces. And as the city continues to gentrify, it becomes more and more crucial to advocate for black cultural practices not to be silenced just because they are considered a nuisance. This takes me to my second point, which is that white sonic expectation is detrimental to black life and black health. Take, for example, the murder of 17-year-old Jordan Davis, shot by Michael Dunn at a gas station in 2012 for refusing to turn down the music playing in his friend's car or the churches in Oakland that are fined thousands of dollars for the sounds of worship that spill out of their front doors. Or in DC last summer, where the DC Council attempted to pass the Amplified Noise Act, a bill for the entire city that threatened street musicians and buskers with either a $300 fine, impounding of their equipment by the Metropolitan Police Department, or up to 10 days in jail, because residents of Gallery Place were tired of the noise. These examples are few among many, but they outline how black people are consistently punished for their sonic practices. Gogo is no exception here, having been surveilled by the Metropolitan Police Department in their infamous Gogo report, which tracked Gogos in DC uh, in Prince George's County, Maryland in the early 2000s. On this note though, I wanna leave you with the promise that Gogo music is not going anywhere. I do not engage in salvage ethnography. That is, I am not scrambling around the city attempting to record the last Gogo shows of this age with the idea that at some point Gogo will no longer exist in DC. I do not participate in the sensationalizing of the gentrification narrative where people will say things like Gogo is dead or there are no more black people in DC. The violence of gentrification needs no embellishment. What I am trying to do is support a robust community that shows no signs of slowing down, the organizing, the musicianship, like the chops, the determination and flexibility that the go-go community exhibits, this is keeping the genre alive. I'm here to amplify and to do what I can to better understand the connections between go-go and BLM, all the while hold, showing that holding space saves us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. So, um, in 1963, jazz pianist Billy Taylor wrote a, and recorded a song called I Wish I Knew What It Would Feel to Be Free. The song later became an anthem for the civil rights movement. 
Every line in every verse signals a yearning for the knowledge, the feeling, the experience of freedom. But what does freedom mean? Semiotics, semantics, words and meaning, signifiers, signifieds, uh, positionality, cultural context, and knowledge. All of these concepts are critical to helping us navigate the cultural bridge that has uh, the potential of either connecting or dividing us. This shifting, unfixed meaning of freedom is at the core of the problems we continue to have in this country. So I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so dwelling on this question by sharing some revelations from my most recent semester teaching at the University of Massachusetts and by inviting you to reconsider Billy Taylor's song. My chapter in the Black Lives Matter and, and Music book revolved around my position as a professor at Mizzou, as a scholar trained in ethnomusicology and folklore research, and as a chair of the Black Studies Department. Of course, through it all, I walk through the world as a black woman, a wife, a sister, and a mother of three. All of these reference points undergird my understandings of what happened with our student activists and informed my decisions to support them. In 2015, in the aftermath of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Tamir Wright, Rice, uh, Mike Brown, and so many others, black students and their allies around the country were asking the question, what does freedom mean and what should it feel like on our campuses and in the country? By the fall of 2015, racial tensions were simmering at Mizzou. The student body president was called the N-word. There was a hunger strike and a boycott by the football players. Things dramatically boiled over when some student activists approached the system president, Tim Wolfe, intent on communicating their expectation of what a free and comfortable campus felt like. So they asked him if he understood what systemic oppression meant. This is how he defined it. I will give you an answer, and I'm sure it will be a wrong answer. You don't Google it? I will give you an answer, and I'm sure it will be a wrong answer. What do you think systematic oppression is? It's systematic oppression is because you don't believe that you have the equal opportunity for success. You don't believe that Let's just stop it right there. <laughs> So, so, I mean, also just sort of pay attention to, again, words, meaning, um, definitions. What was clear from Tim Wolfe, from my neighbors, from my book club and church friends, from the hate mail and death threats I received in the aftermath of, Miz of the Mizzou movement was that we had a very different understanding of racism and freedom in America. We all knew it, it exists or for some people that it existed at some point, but our proximity to the reality means that we have different understandings and perhaps different degrees of motivation to interrupt the trend. I conclude in our book that, quote, folklore and music offer us a ready way of observing, analyzing, and learning about black struggle and liberation. Indeed, the classes I teach consistently challenge students to interrogate the meaning and feeling of freedom and liberation. Last semester, I taught two classes that have inspired new directions in my scholarship. Firstly, I taught a class called Revolutionary Concept in African American Music. I was pleasantly surprised by the composition of the class, mostly white folks, um, and was eager to see how they would respond in our journey through American history through the music that shaped each wave of resistance to oppression and supremacy. So here's the uh, song list that we went through. You can take a picture for summer homework, if you would like. Um, the class reached an interesting speed bump, though, when we got to items 27 and 28. Can you see them? Yes? The men were completely disengaged from, th from these two albums. It seemed Beyonce was cool when she was with Jay-Z on the Carter's Everything is Love album. They loved that. But Lemonade was too focused on women's issues. The five black women in the class were stunned and, and, and offended. They reasoned that if black women had labored through history to resist white supremacy, patriarchy, most recently starting the Black Lives Matter and the hashtag MeToo movements, then why why aren't their issues all our issues? 
It was one of the most illuminating class discussions I've ever moderated. Subsequently, a few of the men in, in the class sent me emails to try and articulate their reticence with these contemporary albums by black women. David, one of the black men in the class, explained, quote, black men do not relate to albums such as Lemonade as it is very based around concepts and experiences of black womanhood, end of quote. Another black male student, Akil, agreed. He wrote, quote, I think because Lemonade is, is full of so many critiques of men, specifically black men and how they treat our women, I can admit that many men don't want to hear that subject matter and be held accountable for our actions, end of quote. I found these reactions candid and honest. These responses made me wonder what other folks think about Songs of Freedom by black women artists. In class, we talked a lot about positionality, context, meaning, and proximity. We went back down our list, threaded black women's issues through Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, Billie Holiday, Nina Simone, Mary Lou Williams. We talked at length about Abby Lincoln's contribution to Max Roach's Freedom Now Suite and dwelt on the, the particularities and urgencies that fueled the push for black women's freedom. We studied um, Lincoln's article she wrote for Jet Magazine in 1968, in which she titled, Who Will Revere the Black Woman? And there are just a, a couple of, of quotes there. I continued to think about these issues in my other class, Race and the American Story. This class is part of a larger project that I'm working on with a colleague, Adam Seagrave, who now teaches at Arizona State University. We had both created this course at Mizzou, we, we, we both taught there, after the student movement, and, and um, we wanted to get away from the hashtags um, and tweets. We wanted to offer our students a more robust context for the discussion of race in our society. After Adam and I both moved at the same time to, to different large land-grant universities in red and blue states, we decided to teach the, the class simultaneously on our respective campuses, and then we brought all our students together at a symposium in Arizona, which is this picture, this past April. Again, it was clear that there is no fixed definition of the notion of freedom. Our readings comprised documents, essays, speeches, and poetry designed to follow the evolution of the discourse on race in America, from the Declaration of Independence to uh, Donald Trump's special op-ed when the five black boys were exonerated in the Central Park case. Here's a list of our readings. We talked about how freedom was framed differently by bl white men, black men, and black women, represented by Phyllis Wheatley, Sojourner Truth, Frances Harper, Ida B. Wells, Anna Julia Cooper, and Zora Neale Hurston. For Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, freedom for African Americans meant complete separation and removal from places where white people lived. For Ida B. Wells, freedom for African, Amer African Americans meant the ability to live in a country with laws that applied equally to all without fear of being lynched. One of the assignments in this class was to prepare an annotated playlist of music that captures the theme of race and the American story as it unfolded in the readings. Again, we found it interesting to ponder the definitions of freedom from the black women who made up about 20% of the combined list. I'd like to use my last couple of minutes on one of the songs that made it onto the list. Nina Simone's version of Billy Taylor's song, I Wish I Knew What It Would Feel To Be Free. Let's quickly con consider what freedom means for Nina Simone. She recorded it in 1967, and many others have covered it over the years. This is just a few of the people who've, who've covered it. Jeff Gold Goldblum. Hmm. <laughs> Let's consider these three, three covers and, and think about what each person's positionality brings to the concept that Taylor originally intended. So we're returning now to the concept of semiotics and meaning. Um, so I'll play a little piece of Nina Simone, and then, um, so I'd like to look at these three, but I think I only have time for two. So um, here's Nina's um, version. I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me I wish 
I could say all the things that I should say, say them loud, say them clear, for the whole round world to hear. I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart, remove all the bars that keep us apart. So um, it's a beautiful song, and you can see why it became part of the civil rights movement. It became an anthem. Um, but let's, let's take a look at what John Denver does with it. Um, I'm particularly interested in how he changes some of the lyrics. So let's listen to maybe one verse. And I wish I knew how it would feel So um, if you think about the lyrics that um, John Denver, where am I, am I there? Yeah, that, that John Denver um, changes. He says, I wish I could say all the things I'd like to say instead of um, all the things that I should say. This change signifies uh, an assurance that he has something to say and that um, these are things that we need to hear. It's, it's just a very, sh a, 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 a tiny little um, twist that reminds us about his position of privilege. And then he goes on to, and this is the, the one that, that really got me, um, when he says, um, I wish I could remove every doubt that keeps us apart rather than every bar that keeps us apart. It reminds me a little bit of Tim Wolfe's definition of systemic racism, right? This idea that you all have doubts about freedom, let me help you unpack those, those doubts as if the agency is with us to, black folks to, um, to, take care of, to, to take care of our perceptions of something that is not quite real. Um, so, so th this is how I'm, 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 I'm looking at it. And, and, and then when we look at Mary Travers of P Peter, Mary, Peter, Paul, and, and, and Mary, she recorded it in 1972, and, and her change was, I wish I could say all the things I know I should say, in, instead of I wish I could say all the things I should say, right? So um, that thinking about a white woman, thinking of saying all the things I, I know I should say, but I'm not saying, helps us think about um, what have been the voting patterns for example, of white women, right? What what has happened in the last few years around um, the continuation of certain types of patriarchy in our society? Now let's consider all the linguistic and extra linguistic sing signals that Nina is serving us in this last piece I want to, to play, where she performs at the Montreux Jazz Festival in 1976. Mm -hmm. So just again pay pay attention to to the small the the small things. Yeah, we're mad. 
address. Right. Um, so, just go to the end. Um, when Nina or Beyonce or Janelle Monae sing, we should all imagine what their yearnings are for freedom. We can and should, all of us, do the work to imagine what freedom looked like for, for example, Erica Garner, the daughter of Eric Garner, um, for Sandra Bland, for Winnie Mandela, Fumilaya Ransom Kuti, the mothers of Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and Mike Brown. For as Angela Davis reminds us, freedom is indeed a constant struggle. And quote, it is in the collectivities that we find reservoirs of hope and optimism. Thank you. Testing, great. Well, thank you all for this, uh, these wonderful presentations and putting together this wonderful book that I really do encourage you all to read. It provides a lot of food for thought and I think we can have an interesting conversation through the last part of this program. Um, I jotted down a lot of questions and I think particularly for our audience, I appreciate putting the, the musical movement, the social movement in a larger context in, in looking at black music and how it really has had a legacy of uh, being an agent in social change. And so my first question, I think in the essays in the book, we look at pedagogy and we look at place. And I wonder if there's any room for contextualizing this movement, um, particularly in relationship to music, beyond that context. Um, talking about those of us who are not in the academy or dealing with specific locale, how does, um, what is the meaning of the movement Black Lives Matter and the music beyond those circles? Seems like Ali, Ali's work takes us there, right? Yeah. Testing? Can you all hear me? No. Okay. Um, so I would say outside of the local and outside of um, specifically academic spaces, we can think a lot about party music. We can think a lot about nightlife, um, which you know I think about DC specifically, but you know nightlife is is everywhere, um, and this is happening everywhere. I was in New Orleans earlier this year, and somebody said something about how they have stoplights in clubs now, and if the noise gets above a certain level, the light will turn yellow, mm. um, or it'll turn red. Um, and so we're talking about the policing of black sound everywhere. Um, and so I think nightlife is definitely a space in which we can think through these things. Okay. And can I just add, I think also we remind ourselves often that the students that we teach in these classes, right, are, they don't, they weren't born on campus and they don't, and they won't be there forever, we hope, right? Um, and so they are parts of communities outside the, the campus and their understandings of what we do in, in the classroom are, can be translated to communities that they go back to or they, that they return to. So I think there's a lot that we do in, in the classroom that, um, that bleeds into um, outside the academy, hopefully. Well, let's talk a little more about that. Um, you know, in circles, we just had a little symposium here last week talking about activist ethnomusicology versus applied and getting out of the classroom. You, you're working with students who do go out in their local communities, but how do, and anyone can speak to this, um, defining the activism impulse in doing this work and, and thinking about music in this way and encouraging people to apply it in real world situations. My experience with teaching courses in black music in particular, when we get to the sections on, on politics, is kind of mixed. Um, at least my institution, the vast majority of our students are white. Um, political music right now is also on trend. So I think of the, the students that I say I can maybe cross a few over to actually think about this as part or be more active in a movement and not just being consumer of something that is popular and trendy. Um, this music has a great beat to it. Um, you can overlook what the, what the messages are really talk about, talking about. Um, that's my concern, but there was always going to be that, hand, that handful that will take it that one step further 
and it does happen in different spaces when we do protest and we do show up. So that's important in a, in a school where only 7%, about 8% are African American and they're the ones who are in the front lines kind of protesting at our campuses. Um, I think also that um, uh, the trend in our universities now is towards STEM fields and um, away from the humanities and courses like the ones that we teach. And so we have a great opportunity in folklore and ethnomusicology to actually um, remind our, in our institutions that um, the work that, that we do is actually practical, right? That it is, um, that we can impact the lives of, of our communities, our society um, in our classrooms. Um, it's difficult for, I mean, I mean, STEM is important, don't get me wrong, but, um, but I think that we have a role to, to play there as well. And I think that um, as ethnomusicologists who work on, several of us, of course, all of us here, work on contemporary music, right? So um, we can take what we're doing and remind our chancellors, our provosts, our deans, that this is important work that has impact. You, you know, we're not just studying Beethoven and Mozart, which is wonderful, but there are musics that, that are happening right now that are gonna change the way we think about the way we all live, right? Um, so I, I think that's, Im that's important, but, but the other part of your, of your question um, r makes me think about how also dangerous this work is, right? So when we think about um, activism in the classroom at state universities that are funded by the state legislature, right? Um, this is also a, a difficult dance. I want to, add to, to acknowledge that Ellen Erdley, um, who, was, who was my colleague at Mizzou, she's, she's right here in the audience. Um, Ellen was um, the head of, of the Title IX office at, at Mizzou when this was going on, right? And she and I had lots of conversations about what does it look like to support our students, but how do we do it in a way that we don't jeopardize our offices, our departments, right? The people who work with us and for us. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous field, but it's a field that needs to be um, engaged. Can I ask, we'll add, add to something that struck me as being interesting because one of the things that are growing in, our, in my institute is environmental studies. And the way we have kind of, as ethnomusicologists, inserted ourselves in environmental studies is through understanding that human geography is part of the environment and that we are part of the science business that you're, you're growing on, on campuses. Oh, I, I kind of want to push that a little bit for someone who works in, in the public sector. And, and I think those challenges are very real. Um, and when, in talking about the movement, there's a lot of power in solidarity. What about when you're not in like-minded spaces? What does it mean to do this type of work out there on your own? Um, what kind of impact can it have? And, and what challenges does it present? How do we really get to the point that your students go out into the world and really apply what they've learned to try to make music do something? Um, it's not an easy task and those safe um, you know, sometimes you are out there on the fringe on your own. And I don't know if you have any guidance or any sense of what that means and, and how that shapes the work. Um, generally, I try to start with creating a sense of, of safe spaces for everybody by, you know, even if in this environment, I don't know if you're here because you're interested in Black Lives Matter, if you, because you're just walking by, I don't know if I'm gonna offend anybody. And some of the language that we listen to is very shocking for some folks. Um, but I have to kind of set a, a, a standard that you know this is something that's going to happen, be prepared for it, and let's talk it out. Um, and I will have students who are coming in there with a, you know, an attitude that's going to be controversial or co contrary to what, I, to what I'm talking about, even before I even get an opportunity to, to spit it out. Um, but I make sure that everyone has an opportunity to like say their piece. We can get around and kind of have, there's an opportunity even on a course that I teach online where we have a, a chat room where we can actually kind of have a space where you can say something and I can address it in, in some places. It's also private, so can I, you know, you can say it privately to me and not get the whole class and we can address it in, in large spaces like that. But it's, it's 
it's never a sure thing. Um, I will still have an occasion student that will walk out. Um, I still have some students, who, but it's, it's gone down, I have to say. Um, in 2015, 2016, there were much, much more forceful uh, counter um, points um, that I had to deal with than I, I have to right now. So more people are kind of fleshing out what it is Black Lives Matter actually means, and uh, as opposed to being just uh, immediately um, concerned about the fact that it's, it's not about all of us. I think we, I mean, we always get pushback, right? Um, whether it's in the classroom, I mean, Ali's a candidate um, at, at Indiana where we all went to school, um, and I'm sure that you have colleagues who are not understanding what, what you're doing. So I think that we, we, are, we experience that quite a lot. Um, but, I th but music has a way of um, sort of opening up lines of, of, of conversation. Um, you know, I'm critiquing John Denver here, but I'm sure glad he, he picked a civil rights song, right? That's lovely. Now, if you could do the next step and not change those lyrics or <laughs> explain what he did with those lyrics. But again, you know, when, when students come, come to our, our, our classrooms, we are, um, I know that we will get pushed back. In the, in, in the revolutionary music in African American, the revolutionary concepts in African American music class. That's what's on the catalog, right? It's called revolutionary concepts in African American music. I got uh, a, an angry email from a student saying I'm talking too much about African American music. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so that always comes um, and I think that um, we just have to, to keep at it. We can't um, signal to our, our dean or our, our, um, our colleagues that because of the pushback, we will go ahead and not teach, teach these, these things. Um, in the class that, that I taught, I, I noticed that, you know, at the beginning they were, my, um, some of my students were like, you know, wondering. Um, I also teach a class on soul and country music and at Mizzou and the country folks would come in and be like, what's she doing up there? You, you know, but, but with time, you know, when, when, when we um, bring our expertise in folklore and ethnomusicology to the conversation, we help them frame it, we help them think about it, we help them um, get under the, all those layers. Um, and usually I'm really fulfilled at the end of, of, the, of the semester, but it is hard work. I, I was struck, Fernando, there's some point you wrote in your essay that you're looking, you're trying to work with students to look at rap um, not as just a style of music making disconnected by human agency. And I think that's central here to the story about black music and the ways of opening doors of dialogue and really understanding how the music um, shapes society and is an agent in society. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, getting this whole concept of Black Lives Matter and looking at contemporary music, are there places where that movement is expressed beyond vernacular music? Is it just limited to, to rap and hip hop and, and R&B? And do you see instances of that that are d definitely in dialogue with what's going on um, in these genres? Actually, I have, I have three different lectures that I have put together for this period. So I have lots of, I have like 40 slides, but. I actually brought some of these examples from um, uh, other genres. Uh, Ariana Grande has a pop tribute to Black Lives Matter issues. Um, there are um, anti-police or anti-police violence songs in the punk communities. And there's a, um, now there's a rock group that just produced something. Oh no, it was uh, Bruce Springsteen. Bruce mm -hmm. Springsteen has had produced a song and continues to uh, and kind of re, he wrote the song I think in 2009. And then when um, Trayvon Martin passed away, he started playing at his concerts in 2014 in tribute to him. And then as others had um, passing away in the sort of similar situations, um, it became a, a very much of a rock anthem in the pro Black Lives Matter movement in the rock scenes in which you know, the audience says, we're not listening to rap music, we're not listening to R&B, where it is, you know, tends to be the, the dominant um, spaces where you can listen to those types of messages. Where's the evidence of revolution in, in beyond 
lyrics and textual and topical? Where is the sonic revolution? What are we, what are the performative? You know, I think we can talk about party music and the outdoor nature and gathering people. But where can we locate some of those revolutionary tactics beyond textual? show, you know, but, but every time you see a video or a clip from the show, you're, you know, constantly reminded. Um, and I just saw a set of uh, Trouble Funk with hashtag I can't breathe shirts in, in reference to Eric Garner. So I think um, there's a lot textually, not in lyrics, but in, um, in, in what they wear and how they present themselves. And then um, if I could also give you another item for summer homework. Um, um, in 1960, Max Roach, jazz drummer, came out with a, a wonderful album called um, We Insist, Max Roach's Freedom Now Suite. It's, it's a jazz album. I'm completely obsessed with this album because it does, it does this, right? It, it takes us on this sonic journey from slavery all the way to um, apartheid, right? So I'm, I, I, I think about it as a sort of a quintessential Africana text because it, it takes us to African um, freedom um, movements from, from, from colonialism, um, protests in 1960s here, here in the US. Um, there are some, some lyrics on there that help, help it, but when you listen to the drumming of Max Roach, you, you hear the, the revolution there. Um, and, and before Max Roach did, did that album, there were a couple of other freedom suites in, in jazz that, um, that help us think about that. And then, you know, if you look at what, I know we don't want to mention him, but Kanye West, um, <laughs> what he does sonically in, in terms of his, the particular choices um, in um, sampling, you know, it's incredibly thoughtful, um, you know, and Jay-Z as, as well. Um, here I am t talking about all these men when we should be talking about the women, is what I said, right? Um, but, but look at what, um, um, Lauren Hill did with um, her, her retake of, of Favorite Things, you know, that, that um, nice little um, pleasant song from Sound, of, Sound of, of Music. Not only how she sings it, but what the instruments do behind her, her voice. So I think there are opportunities to see revolution beyond the lyrics and beyond the text. But I think this generation, we've, we've trained We've been, we've been trained and socialized to look for lyrics and look for videos, and we're not doing the work to really get under it and listen to, to what the saxophones are doing or what the violins are, are, are doing or what the congas are, are doing. Um, there is opportunity, we're just not um, trained for it okay. or socialized for it. I'd like to add um, Super Bowl 50. Are you familiar with Super Bowl 50's halftime performance? Um, Beyonce comes out with a lot of women in black wigs. This was also happening in the Bay Area. It was also the 50th anniversary of the um, Black Panther Party, mm -hmm. started in 1966. So this was a visual, you didn't have to listen, you just had to see all these women lined up in the black berets. And there's also a message that there were actually more women involved with the Black Panther Party than men, numerically speaking. Um, also sonically, um, 1980, Sylvia Robinson, founder of Sugar Hill Records, produces a song, Good to Be Queen, which might be a typical party rap song about how, you know, boasting about every, all the things that she has. But it's also a song about black empowerment. Um, the intro is the Black National Anthem, just discified. And if you don't know the Black National Anthem, you'll miss that. Um, that's not it. But <laughs> And it's not meant for everybody, you know? So that's a kind of a message. The, all the things that she's saying that she's proud to have gotten through her ownership of this record company, her ability to purchase things, the fact that all of her employees are black, that's part of the song too. It's mm -hmm. not just a song about celebrating how great I am. And so you miss that if you're not paying attention to what's written in between those lines. Anyone um, watched Homecoming, Beyonce's Homecoming? Yeah. If you haven't, homework. Um, 
But what Beyonce does with um, her shout out to traditions from black, the, from historically black colleges and, and um, drum, drum lines, again, don't even listen to what she's singing, just listen to the music um, and it'll blow your mind. Great. Um, I want to take a little opportunity to see if there are any questions from the audience um, to ask any one of our panelists. Um, I see, I mic. see that in the back, and there's a mic right there. We'll start, and then I see you over here. Um, thank you for this. is a wonderful way to miss lunch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got too many questions, but I just wanted to just throw in something as a comparison. We're having the same issues in England, yeah. obviously. Mm -hmm. You can imagine people gentrification in Brixton complaining to the police that the reggae music is too loud. I'll leave it there. The Black Matters chapters that are opening up in Canada and the UK as well. Hello. I, I really don't have a question, but just more of a comment, just an acknowledgement of something I noticed, at least with Black Lives Matter, and kind of to piggyback on your comment on the words and mm -hmm. the meanings and various meanings behind the words. But before I started working at the library, um, I worked in the advertising marketing world. And so I say that to say I kind of pay close attention to advertisements and advertising. And I've noticed over the past few years that a lot of companies and advertising agencies are using the word matter in their campaigns a lot. And if you all pay really close attention, you'll start to notice that there are a lot of buzzwords matters, like Mazda driving matters, AARP, retirement matters. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, and it's becoming a point where it's almost like it's insulting or it almost takes steam and power out of the Black Lives Matter movement and just that simple word. So I kind of wanted that comment to be on record because it's, it's subtle, but just as someone who notices it, I really wanted at least this comment to be on the record and in the archive. So, and maybe it's something worth looking into as far as research, but um, it's, it's subtle and I think it's a bit disrespectful, um, you know, just to use that word in these advertising campaigns. So. And it's part of a long tradition too of co-opting and appropriating certain, whether it's music, images, or whatever, words for another use. So it, I, it's part along those lines of what you're talking about. We had a hand up over here. Thank you, and, and thank you for speaking to us. It's really interesting. Um, you talked a lot about institutions external to music, policing uh, black bodies, black culture, black music itself. And um, I, it made me think of uh, the recent controversy with Old Town Road and the Old Town Road remix. And I was wondering if you had thought about um, the institutions within music that police black music and what we can do to disrupt that and, and um, yeah, to stop things like that. That song. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, of course, this is the collaboration between Lil Nas, what's his name? Lil Nas, Nas X. X. Um, and... Billy Ray Cyrus. Yes, Billy Ray Cyrus, I'm sorry. Um, and so it, it gained a lot of traction and we didn't know whether part of that was sort of like tongue in cheek, ha ha ha, it's kind of funny. Um, and so over the last, I would say five, seven years, um, uh, there have been some attempts by country artists and by soul artists to, to cross over and and create, and create fusions. Um, some have been good and some have been terrible. Um, there was one that LL Cool J did with, um, you know, the one I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, not, not a good one. Um, but the intent was, was good, right? Um, and what I, I, I th and so this, this last one, the, the old time road piece, um, I think was, I still don't know if it's just a joke. Do you, is it a joke? I don't. The thing is, like, all my friends love viral I know, it's catchy, exactly. It's, it's catchy, um, but then when you look at the visual and what he's wearing and everything, you know, it's like, hmm, I don't know. But um, what I say to, um, what I think about is, is exactly what, what you said, which is that the industry has created these divisions, right, these markets. Right, that if we really look back at country music and soul music, we will understand that it all comes from the South. It all comes from the same 
um, place, right? Um, but somewhere along the line, it's been it's been co-opted by um, by the industry and for for money because they're looking for markets. Um, and now there's a sense that country music is white people's music, so southern white folks, right? And um, soul music is is black folks' music. But if you ask certain uh, African Americans of a certain generation, they love country music. Love country. Well, not all, but 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 some. Um, but if you talk to young Af young Af African Americans, they will say that country music is whack, right? Vice versa with with white white students of this generation with soul music, they won't listen. But um, I I spend a whole semester trying to break that down so that they can see if they go back and listen to Woody Guthrie and Lead Belly. There's so much commonality there. Versus, I don't know. The More Dixie recently, Kicks Beyonce. Uh, the Beyonce, Kicks. right? Exactly. So, 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 I think you're exactly on on point with how the industry has has had a ha, has played a great part in dividing us um, as as listeners to this wonderful music. If I can just talk a little bit more about Old Town Road for one second, I was like fully invested in the Yeehaw agenda for like a good two weeks last semester. So I taught a class called Hearing Race in Place in the US. Um, and we got into a lot of these kinds of things. We talked a lot about Ariana Grande, cultural appropriation. And one of the questions that I, that I posed to my class is if, if a black soundscape is the most popular soundscape in global pop music, what's a pop artist to do? So what's Ariana to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, to, be, to be on the pop chart, you know, you kind of have to hit this trap sensibility. And so then we flipped it when we got to Old Town Road in terms of what's at stake for a black artist with trap sensibilities to be on the country music billboard chart, what's gonna be lost? And so we talked about it in terms of a lot of um, who's losing ground mm -hmm. in, in that way. We didn't, you know, of course, come up with a perfect answer. But in terms of framing it of, of like, if the, the soundscape of country music is so associated with whiteness, what's lost if, that, if that's given to Lil Nas X, who we can't tell if he's serious or not? Mm -hmm. I, th I think he is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm grateful to learn from you guys. I have two questions. One is for Ali. Could you talk a little bit more about the extension of the hashtag Don't Mute DC, um, maybe into spaces that we don't automatically read as sonic? I'm thinking about like Sankofa and the tax abatement kind of debate. And tell us, for those of us who are who live here, like more about Don't Mute DC and what we could do. And then my other question is for Professor Shonikin. You mentioned that you and your colleague had taught the same class at the same time. Could you say a little bit more about um, what you discovered when you sort of put those two classes together? Sure. Thank you. So I have been trying my best to follow Don't Mute DC not being at home, which is awful. Um, I found out that one of my brothers was at Mochella, and I'm like, can you please send me a new video? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so it spilled into a lot of different different avenues because again, we're talking really broadly about cultural erasure, right? So one of these things would be Sankofa, a really famous Afrocentric bookstore that's up Georgia Avenue, again, only a few blocks from, um, from Savannah, Florida, which is like the epicenter of this thing. Um, and Sankofa is facing, you know, the closing down of the store because of, I think it's like $30,000 in, in tax and, and they're working on tax abatement. And so people, I swear every other day, I see a whole crowd of people um, you know, testifying to the council in these hearings, these hearings are marathons, I mean. And, and then part of it is that not only are we looking, you know, to the future in terms of cultural erasure, but we're still working on things that were happening in the past. So the Amplified Noise Act that I mentioned, that's still on the table. They took out the, the jail time because that was, you know, understandably freaking a lot of people out, but um, <laughs> it's still on the table. And so they're really trying to outlaw um, amplified noise that's plainly audible at 75 feet, which is not really a thing that you can measure. Um, because as soon as a person comes with a decibel meter, you will be quiet and you will be like, I was not audible at 75 feet. Um, so we're really stretching backwards and forwards here in terms of um, what, who is allowed to, to relegate sound and, and black cultural spaces in DC. And so there's been rallies, there's been at least three or four Mochellas. I know they had a Memorial Day Mochella at Freedom Plaza. Um, they had a video shoot on the first with Rare Essence. They had a whole festival, you know, at 7th in Florida. 
Um, they've been working with the Funk Parade um, to have panels there. They've been working with United Medical Center to bring awareness to the fact that there's little to no um, maternity care and health care in Southeast. I mean, this has spread far and wide because, I mean, it's like a powder keg. People are ready. I mean, people have been ready and doing this work for a long time, but people are especially ready right now. It's like powder cake? Yeah, powder cake. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question about, because, you know, we didn't know what would, what would happen when we brought our, my students from Massachusetts, which is supposedly a very progressive state, right, to a very, a rather red state, I'll say rather red. Um, and Arizona, and so Adam's students were, were I, I, I think, mostly um, Republican, and mine were, were mostly Democrats. And so, and, and we knew that, that that would possibly happen at these kinds of state institutions. Um, but the, the symposium was wonderful because they had spent the whole um, three months leading up to it reading this stuff. There is no getting around what Thomas Jefferson says about black people. You, if you, once you read it, you know it, and you can't unknow it. Right? Um, what um, Abraham Lincoln, the emancipator himself, said about freedom for black people, like take them away. Do not let them mix with, with us. They are not equal to us in, in that way, right? So by, by the time the symposium happened, our students had been like, um, they, were, they were doused with this, this knowledge. So when, we, when, when they all met, they were on, on, on equal ground, right? And, and they could have some real um, conversations about, oh, we get it. This country was never great, right? Um, so, so what what can we do to um, create um, and continue this this dialogue? So Adam and I are going to where it's become a, a much bigger thing. Um, it'll be a yearly thing where we bring students together. Um, we think that there are. I have to be be careful because we're being recorded. Um, you know the the. Pots of money that we can get are pots of money that are in places that I'm surprised at, you know. But that's also good, right? That that people who you I didn't think would be interested in in this this project are interested in funding it, you know. And so you know that's that's something we kind of have. I kind of have to think about a, a little bit. But you know, if folks want to give to give their money and support. Um, hopefully, they'll also read the stuff that we're reading, and maybe there will there will be be change. It's I think one of the more exciting things that I've done in the classroom in a long time. So, so uh, I'll, I'll I have a, a brief comment and a question. So the comment has to do with this. Uh, um, policing of black sound, and it's just a, a famous story from the annals of the American Folklife Center here. In 2003, we had uh, our concert series out on the Neptune Plaza, and we had Chuck Brown. We had a go-go concert with Chuck Brown. Uh, about halfway through the concert, we got a phone call from the Supreme Court <laughs> telling us to please shut down the noise. Um, luckily, we knew that by the time we could get that message backstage and have anything happen, the concert would be over anyway. So it just ran its course. But it did have something to do with us bringing the Neptune Plaza concert series indoors um, after, after that. So, but the question has to do with um, allyship and uh, appropriation. Because um, when, when you said, Professor Shonikin, that it, would, that it was nice that John Denver sang a civil rights song, there was also kind of a hesitation in your voice in saying that. Uh, and the question is, is it, is it nice for a white guy to sing a song about the oppression of other people, whether women or, or African Americans, or, and, and how you can go about that without it being appropriation on the one hand, um, or you know, at least uh, patronizing on the other. So is, is there a good answer to that question? Yes. Um, yes, I think it is nice that that white men do do this. In fact, it's critical that m white men do it for for all of us. 
Um, you know, I can, as a black woman, talk about black, life, black women and our issues from now till the end of time, you know. Um, when Lemonade came out as a, on HBO, my two daughters and my son, and my, one of my daughters is, is here, we all went down to the basement and we watched it, and my son, who is, at the time was 17, was rolling his eyes, oh my gosh. You know, even my son, right, <laughs> um, had issues with, with, with Lemonade, you know, so, but, but, un, but until he and John Denver and, um, and everyone else sees um, these issues as their issues as well, um, we, we are just talking. Um, to add to what Fernando said earlier, there's a wonderful um, song by a country artist called, his name is Will Hoag, H-O-A-G, um, and he did a song called um, Ballad for Trayvon Martin, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a country song. He didn't even, he didn't try to, to rap or do, or, or do anything. It's a, it's a, it's a ballad like, like the old town, the old time Scottish ballads um, for Trayvon Martin. He did get some, some backlash, but that's what, that's, and of course he wasn't played on, on, on the radio. Um, he was Dixie Chicked. Um, but, but um, if we get more like that, you, you know, then we start to, to see a groundswell. For now, we, it's, just, it's just grassroots, it's, it's, it's just us. And, um, you know, I was, I was side-eyeing John, John Denver, but, <laughs> but, but I really do think it, it's important for people like him to step out of his lane and, and do things like that. Well, I, I think if we have no more questions, I think we're gonna wrap things up for this afternoon. Please uh, thank our panelists for this wonderful. <laughs>